I'm back, and I've got a week worth of topics and only about 15 to 20 minutes. Who knows where I'm going to go? It's all next on Tip Off. Boom, 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 boom. Fired up just to talk. Boom, 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 and share. Boom, 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 and give you some thoughts. Boom, 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 boom. How are you? Nice to talk to you again. Sorry for the week away. I went on an Alaska cruise with the in-laws. They took the whole shebang. It was 10 of us. It was fabulous. We had a great time. They're class people. It was their 50th wedding anniversary. I can only hope to attain that. Uh, it was really cool. All right, I am loaded with a stack of notes here. Uh, and I will probably need your lead here in the next few days, uh, the old hashtag lock tip off. If you have something that took place in the last week that I did not get to because I wasn't around that you really want discussed, we can do it. Um, Paterno deal just came down. I have some, some thoughts on, uh, on some of that. That happened right as I was leaving. Uh, I sent out a trolling tweet about gun control uh, the other day. Actually, it didn't have anything to do with gun control. It was actually just a fact. Um, and may get to that. May not also, because I will stick with what our brand is, which is Jazz first, NBA second, and Utah sports third. Uh, lots has happened. Um, the rivalry kind of came, went, and then Pac-10 got a uh, complete pie in their face on the fact that their Big Ten deal is not going to happen, and suddenly you wonder whether or not we ever need to have this rivalry problem in the first place. Um, Really, it came down to now that uh, Utah thought it was going to go away because of that Big Ten relationship, so then they just decided to play Michigan instead of BYU for a year. That, that one, self-explanatory. All right, let's talk about the Jazz. Uh, Raja Bell sits in a holding pattern as we stand here today. Uh, SLC Dunk picked up a neat little tweet. as uh, They did nice work as I kind of reviewed the week. Um, I guess he's in India. Uh, the a people are, why didn't the Jazz amnesty? Why didn't the Jazz amnesty? Well, it doesn't really do the Jazz any good to amnesty because you still pay him all of his contract. And the only thing it does is come off the cap, but the Jazz, are if they're going to sign a free agent, they're going to use the mid-level exception. So they're going to, and then they're going to stay under the luxury tax this year. So they don't gain anything by amnestying him. What the Jazz do gain is a buyout. Uh, the reason on the buyout is they save money. Uh, Raja gains on a buyout, too, because a buyout, if he's an amnestied, he then goes through those waivers and, in theory, could get picked up by somebody. Uh, and, and if the Jazz were to amnesty Raja and he signs a million-dollar contract with the Heat, which is what he wants to do, then uh, he that million dollars, uh, if it's amnesty, the Jazz don't have to pay. So they'll ju why not just come up to a buyout for somewhere around that same dollar figure? The Jazz pay, save a million. Raja gets to choose his team rather than go through the waivers and get possibly get picked up by someone. Not that I think he would. It just worked out better for everyone, but the end result is that Raja will not be on the roster. Uh, the most interesting development of Summer League, since I didn't talk to you by the end of Summer League, uh, is... Jeremy Evans. Jeremy was great, and now the question is, and he should be great. He's a third-year NBA player playing in a summer league, so I'm not sure um, that you can take a lot out of that. But I wonder, but now the question is whether he can do this in a regular NBA season, and is he a four, is he a five, is he a four when we go small, excuse me, is he a four, is he a three? Uh, he, he really hasn't shown any of the skills yet he needs to be a three. If Jeremy Evans is going to be a three, he's going to have to handle, and he's going to have to shoot from the outside. He hasn't shown either of those. Uh, I, I, as good as he was in summer league, at this point he still seems to be a guy who's a tempo-changing, backup power forward, playing second, playing an athletic fast game against second tier bigs and being able to try to take advantage of them. It, it really just becomes a, a weighing an issue with Jeremy. Can he make enough plays on the offensive end with his hustle, his rebounding, uh, his jumping, which is his rebounding, and that part of his game to and block shots defensively 
to outweigh his lack of weight in the post as a power forward defensively that even he had a hard time with in the summer league. That, that's really all it comes down to with Jeremy. And that's a question that Tyrone's going to have to uh, come up with. You know, this roster gets interesting because the way I look at it right now, Mo Williams is your starting point. Gordon is your starting two. Marvin is your starting three. Derek is your starting four probably with Al as your five. Millsap becomes your sixth man who can you can do whatever you want with him. Um, Burks probably becomes your first guard off the bench. Watson or Tinsley is your backup point guard. Cantor is your backup center. And there's your nine-man rotation. And Carroll as a backup wing and Evans as the fifth big are really in the third point guard. Now we're at 12, and I'm forgetting somebody. That's kind of why you keep hearing me pause. Oh, Kevin Murphy, who I don't think will be in the rotation to start. Um, you're... You're, there you are, and really the only thing this team still is short is kind of a dead-eye shooter from the outside. They, they got better uh, with the addition of Marvin Williams, and they got better um, with the addition of Mo Williams shooting, but they still need a dead-eye shooter. Um, and, and that's the last piece of this roster, I think, as it is right now. Kyle Korver, unfortunately, got traded to Atlanta. Uh, though I'm not sure you wanted that dollar figure. Really, ironically, you need someone like Rajan to have it work. <laughs> uh, so we will see how this plays from here. But what I think is interesting about this roster, and I guess what I was trying to say is, that's pretty set. Like, Burks, Millsap, backup three, um, and Canada. That's your nine-man rotation. Um, and how Carroll gets on the floor... Uh, and, and how Evans ever gets on the floor, I think are going to be circumstantial times where what they do helps us. Uh, Damari did not have a very good summer league. Maybe that's not the setting for him to play particularly well. Uh, what's next for the Jazz, everyone wants to know. My, my guess at this point, if there was a major move involving Al or Paul, I think it would have happened. Uh... I'm sure every team's talked, every team knows it's an option, and if it was there, uh, I, I think that they would have, um, they would have explored, I think it would have happened. So my guess is the next road we go down is trying to get an extension done, probably with Paul. Uh, Al, num- I, I think it would be very hard to negotiate an extension with Al right now on where his numbers are, and what the market usually pays for those numbers. Uh, I think it would be hard to get him at a number that seems uh, to get it, get him to a point where you can come up with something. Whereas I think the market, those set high uh, with Ilyasova and a bunch of others this offseason, gives you an idea of where Paul is and probably can get you into some sort. I mean, you're going to have, they're going to start with David Lee and go to Ilya Silva, and then you're going to go to Collison at $2 million, and you both knock all those out, and then you kind of come into the middle somewhere. And somewhere probably between 7 and $10 million a year, you have a number that is appropriate for Paul Millsap as your uh, overpaid third big, but with young guys it's important, uh, and just incredibly valuable player. Uh, to your roster, and I, I kind of would suspect that something's able to get done there if both sides are interested. Now, Paul may decide, you know what, if it, if it means coming off the bench, I'm not interested, but I, I, kind, I feel like this might come together nicely. And I'm a believer that if, we could, if the Jazz can get Paul done, then you move into the season with him coming off the bench. You eliminate some of the side stories uh, that could take place. Al's playing as a free agent, and he's really got to bust it. And frankly, if He's not doing his job defensively. You can make the moves you need to make if you're Tyrone Corbin. So I think that's where we sit right now. The West is really interesting. Uh, obviously, the biggest move in the West, as San Antonio and Oklahoma City have held solid, is is that of Phoenix. Excuse me, is that of Phoenix losing Nash, and what's going and what LA is doing. I, I I keep thinking about this, and there's no question Nash helps you. I mean, I. 
don't don't misunderstand us. And, and there's no question that uh, Nash is going to should in every do a lot of things to help them. Uh, but it, it's curious to me on how they're going to use him. And there's two things that that aren't jiving with me right now. One, one is offensively. I don't see Bynum as a pick and roll player. I see Gasol as a pick and roll player. And so then, where do you put Bynum on the floor? Because Nash really wants four w- out. Pick and roll with Gor- with either three shooters in Gortat or or Fry popping, and Nash wants the ball in his hand. He can create kick, and then Kobe's not a catch and shoot guy. I mean, you create and kick to Kobe, and now he's going to go to work again. There's some things there that just don't meld entirely correctly. They they all have they'll figure it out. But that you know he's Nash is a guy that creates and creates three point shooting, and that's a team that can't shoot the three as well as we do. Uh, the other one is everyone's talk uh, that I keep hearing about. Well, this will take the burden off of Kobe. All right, maybe, maybe. However, when Oklahoma City and the Lakers play, who's guarding Russell Westbrook? It's not Nash. It's Kobe. Who's guarding Tony Parker? It's now Kobe. Who's guarding Chris Paul? I think it's now Kobe. Suddenly, I I wonder if you're actually putting more burden on Kobe than you were before. I, I'm not. I guess I'm not trying to say that I think it hurts them in any way, but I'm not willing to just make this next leap. That oh, it makes them incredible. Uh. Interesting signing by the Clippers. Grant Hill's a nice pickup for them. Uh, And I'm surprised by that. I think everybody thought that they saw um, him heading to the Lakers, but evidently he's heading to the Clippers. I'm right on this, aren't I? I mean, that's like how out of the loop I was. I'm just reading about that, but that one definitely crossed my mind or crossed my line as as surprising uh, to me when I saw that. Uh, It didn't expect him to retire, um, but maybe I kind of expect him to go play with Nash with Lakers, but maybe Grant didn't want to play with Kobe, which would even make me love Grant Hill more than I already do. Um, and, and then the final, uh, there's two teams that, that really kind of it's interesting what they've done. Phoenix starting lineup right now is Drogic, Jared Dudley, Michael Beasley, Luis Scola and Marcin Gortat. Drogic, Dudley, Beasley, Scola, Gortat. I'm not sure what that team is. Um, I'm I'm really, to me, it that team reminds me just didn't get their guys, and so then they just start <clears throat> they just start doing uh. You know, they just start adding guys. I, I'm, I, I'm a little lost. Beasley's not a good player yet. He's inefficient offensively. Um, Gortat is, but it's hard to tell any of those guys how much they were just created by Nash. Uh, I, you know, the Clippers to me, who are another the key. They added Jamal Crawford, which is not a huge move to me. Though it's better than Randy Foy, and it's probably a step up for the role that Mo played. Um, Bledsoe gets more time for them next year. I think they're good, but they they really were never the same after the loss of Chauncey. And the other one is Dallas. Dallas is now Darren Collison, O.J. Mayo, Sean Marion, Dirk Nowitzki with Chris Kamen, and Elton Brand coming off the bench. I think Carlisle is a genius coach, so I think they'll be fine. But again, I'm not even sure I get what that team is. Um, and I guess I'm trying to put them into some sort of a block and say, well, how are you going to play? What is it you're trying to do? Those kind of things. Collison's pretty small, but he's not a great up and down. He's not even a great offensive finisher. Mayo, I, I think, has a, more to offer. Marion's fading. Dirk is great. Brand and Kamen are inefficient offensive players. They just had a very 
contrary to the numbers game, both Phoenix and Dallas strike to me as teams that their game plan didn't work, so then they just started filling in spots. I hope we don't become that team uh, a year from now with all of our cap money. That, that, that would be my concern. Uh, Courtney Lee's a good pickup in Boston. Uh, Summer League, I did not uh, see a lot of it. I've called around to a few people. I didn't see it at Vegas. Jimmer, I guess, really struggling. At, uh, and, I, you know, Sacramento was disappointed with what they got out of Jimmer last year. Uh, really, largely, his offensive inability to run the pick and roll was, is the biggest problem they have, the way they play. He just doesn't run the pick and roll well. It doesn't do it. And that was a considerable problem to them. And now the addition of Aaron Brooks, it's clear that they don't see Jimmer as a point guard. And um, David Thorpe, who I respect immensely, uh, was one of the guys I went back through various Twitter feeds during uh, when I got back to to kind of get an update on from guys I respect and what they tweeted about Summer League. Thorpe killed Jimmer. Uh, I hope it's not as bad as he said. Uh, I thought the interesting comment he made uh, about this was that not, that Jimmer was not doing – that everything Jimmer did, uh, he did what was expected, but that he didn't do anything that um, – that you, you wouldn't expect. That, that he makes the basic play, but he can't make anything beyond that. And then the next thing, uh, it was this tweet that surprised me. Jacker Fredette, or Jimmer, seems to be on a personal mission to enrage his teammates. Black guy could be coming. It's comical, actually. So some of you who saw that will have to make me understand what he meant by that. Um, <clears throat> because it's, uh, you know, I don't, but I guess, you know, maybe Jimmer um, just decided to go on a personal mission. When I first watched uh, Brandon Jennings play in Vegas, I thought his teammates would love playing aside him. Thorpe also tweeted, it's the opposite with Jimmer. So very strange, um, but I think it's a real struggle. Uh, there were rumors that the Jazz were talking to the Kings. Uh, if I'm Sacramento, I'm picking up the phone to call the Jazz. The Jazz can make money out of Jimmer and – uh, if you really don't believe in him in your Sacramento, then you've got to figure out what you're going to do with him. Uh, the, the problem is, for me, I, I think Jimmer's just got to get away. From, the worst thing that can happen to Jimmer is come here. And I, I think Jimmer, I, I'm not sure he can play in the NBA. I mean, I've been open about that the whole time. I, I think he'll figure it out. He's a shot maker, and that's his skill. He's got to figure out how to make it in the NBA. The biggest concern I had with him out of the first year is that I didn't realize how much of a rhythm player he was. And now to get that rhythm is taking him too long in the NBA. Uh, but I think he'll figure that out, and he'll eventually be a shot maker. I mean, he might be Eddie House. On the high end, he might be Jason Terry. These are the same names we've talked about. If he ever can become a point guard, he's Mike Bibby. We've talked about this for a long time. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a spot for him. Defensively, I'm not sure what he'll ever be able to do. Uh, and so if you're Sacramento, you do call the Jazz to see whether they might take him. But I think it would be the worst possible environment for Jimmer. What, for me, Jimmer has to go somewhere where he doesn't have to be Jimmer anymore. He's never going to be Jimmer in the NBA. Uh, and, and that, I think, has maybe been my point the entire time, is that the kid can probably play in the NBA, but he can absolutely under no circumstance be Jimmer again. And so he's got to find a way to get, get with his, his new wife away from all the sideshows, away from the, the posse that he has, which I think is a really bad influence around him, and just go be a basketball player on a team without all the fanfare, meaning that anything in New York or Utah would be – I mean, he really should go to Milwaukee and just hide and figure out his game. And see if he can beat Bino Udric or one of those kind of guys in this league. Uh, but right now, it's obviously not working, and it's sad. Um, final thought, I'll, I'll do Paterno. I, I, uh, uh, quick, I'll, I'll do both these, because I'm sure there'll be enough tomorrow. Uh, so I sent out a tweet about the amount of people who have been killed by guns. And um, I was definitely trolling. I, I wanted to see what happened. Um, I, I would make a point to just myself for a quick second. I didn't make a comment about gun control. I sent out a tweet that told you a fact. And that was the point of the troll. In one year, guns murdered 35 in Australia, 39 in England, 
in Wales, 194 in Germany, 200 in Canada, and 9,484 in the United States. And I got the litany of responses. I thought it was the guns don't kill people. I got it. Here's my, here's what's important to me. We all have different viewpoints on gun control. I don't. We all have different viewpoints on what the Second Amendment gives you or doesn't, and we have different viewpoints on whether what government's right is to do inside of our house, what 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 we're allowed to have or not, or what we they want to take from us, what things are going to force upon us. And that is fine, but we've got to reach a point where we can have reasonable conversations where facts are actually used in the discussion. Now, I got a tweet from a bunch of people, those numbers are skewed because of population. That's a great comment. That's a great point. Those are. Absolutely. And so now let's figure out whether or not, since um, the United States had 9,484 deaths um, and Canada had 200, do we have 494 times more people? No. So we're still on the high end. But we at least have to be able to discuss these things and have what are actual facts be used in conversations. And, and and too much, we just are so set to our point of view. There's got to be some level where, if you read the Fast and Furious story, that we can just buy, that, that Mexican drug cartel people can come to the United States, find a basic homeless food stamp guy, pay, give him a few hundred thousand dollars, have him buy a bunch of guns, transfer them over the border so that they can use them basically as their militia, Fundamentally, something's wrong with that. Now, again, now let's, now let's hold the discussion on what individual rights are, government rights, safety rights, Second Amendment, gun control. What's, what's right, what's wrong? We've got to be able to hold discussions, though. It really doesn't matter, actually, because both the candidates for president are so scared of gun unions. The guns are so powerful that this is kind of an irrelevant. The scary thing is this is an irrelevant conversation. Uh, in regards to Paterno, here's the thought I've had in Sandusky the entire time. As a talk show host in a market, every time I ever criticized Kyle Whittingham or Bronco Mendenhall, I got annihilated. Annihilated. It's really kind of, I don't want to get into that, but... And... Again, probably this goes to the same conversation. If you're a BYU fan, or you're a Utah fan, I'm all for you being all in with your guys, but keep your eyes open. If you're a Nebraska fan to Tom Osborne, when that running back Lawrence Phillips was sticking a woman's head in a mailbox, and then Tom Osborne coming out and saying he needs football, and the Cornhusker fans step back and back at Tom Osborne? We're out of whack. And we're not out of whack with Bronco or Kyle, but maybe in 30 years we will be if they're still the head coaches. Bronco's pretty all-powerful. Kyle's pretty all-powerful. They're not going to do terrible things like what we've seen. But if something even one-tenth of this horrific story of Penn State comes out, the majority of the fan base on each side would immediately jump to their defense. Immediately. And that's really scary. That's the problem. It's almost maybe the same thing. Maybe I'm talking about the exact same thing. That facts can be presented to people right now, and we don't even listen to them. Then hold a discussion and be fair. But at least listen. Great to be back.